everyone, welcome back to another interview. If you are new here, on this channel I interview the brightest minds of physical therapy who share their experience and insights. I am Ariana Tondo, PT, and if you want to improve your patient care and be a successful physical therapist, you start right now by subscribing to this channel and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. And please help us by sharing this video with people that you think it would benefit from learning from the best PTs out there and give us a thumbs up. With you now, Dr. Sandy Murphy. Enjoy! Hi Sandy, welcome to PT Pro Talk. How are you today? Good, Mariana. How are you? I'm good. I'm great and very happy that you are here with me. And before we start, I just want to talk a little bit about how we met. So. Okay. When I moved from Brazil to US, I didn't know anyone. And then I found Sandy's email on the McKenzie website list. And then I reached out to her and she was very nice and friendly and accepted to grab a cup of coffee with me. And then we talked. And after that, I ended up working uh, on her clinic. And she's just such a wonderful person, a great clinician Mm -hmm. and has such a huge heart so I'm very thankful uh, for meeting her so I just want to give this intro and I think it's enough of talking okay <laughs> okay I appreciate let's, that Mariana <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just I just wanted to you know let you know all of that and so let's jump uh, right into the questions so first Sanji could you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself uh, why did you start, uh, decide to become a physical therapist and Uh, How was your path to get to where you are right now working as a clinical director? Okay. Um, I grew up in a very, very rural part of Kentucky um, on just a big, big farm. I was one of two girls and we were always instilled. It wasn't um, if you went to college, but when, where, and how long, how many degrees were you going to get? So that was instilled in us when we were very, very young. And I feel like growing up in that rural area taught us how to work hard. Um, because you didn't stop when you were tired, you stopped when the job was done. Um, and so I feel like that that's carried me through in my college career and in my professional career as well. Um, growing up on a farm, we we're always around animals. Uh, so we were around chickens, cows, goats, ducks. Um, so I thought that I wanted to be a veterinarian. Um, and my dad said, if that's what you want to do, kid, then you need to hang out with them on the farm one day. Um, just see what they do. Mariana, that was awful. Like we had to <laughs> dehorn cattle. Like we put on gloves that took up our whole arm to like reach in a cow and see like how long until <laughs> she gave birth. I mean, it was just, I think they scared me on purpose because I thought I can't, I can't do this. Um, I also love to swim and I love the ocean. And I thought, well, what about marine biology? Cause I just thought I would play with a fish all day. Um, and I learned that that was going to be a lot of time in the lab, a lot of research. And um, I didn't want to do that. So it was time to go to college. So off I went to college, not knowing what I was going to do. And I met somebody that was telling me about physical therapy. I'd never heard of it before in my life. Um, and I thought, well, this sounds like kind of nice cause you get to learn, you get to help people. Um, no matter what choice I'd thought of in career, um, it was always instilled in us as well growing up to help others. So that sense of service was very, um, appealing to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so after my freshman year, I went home that summer and I volunteered at a hospital in the physical therapy department. And I thought, this is what I need to do. Um, I was intrigued by how much they were able to help people, um, how much they knew just about the body, um, how it was like you're problem solving all day, every day. Like you just really got to use your brain. Um, and so that was nice to me. And you got to move. I, the idea of sitting in a cubicle all day, that was not for me. I'm so grateful that there's people out there like my mom's computer programmer that loves that, but I am just, I'm not built that way. Um, so that ended me up in PT school at University of Kentucky. And I practiced in Kentucky, my first job, I think for six or seven years. And it was a really unique program. I had approached um, a company I worked for as a PT tech and asked if they had any like stipend or loan process to help them through school. And it was half stipend, half loan. And I had to work for them for two years afterward. 
Um, but when I first made that deal, everybody thought I was crazy because the market was so plentiful. By the time we graduated, you couldn't buy a job hardly. There were a lot of my oh, classmates, um, this is in 99, that just had to put together PRN jobs for years. Um, so I was very grateful that I did that. Um, but I practiced in Kentucky for a while at a couple, at a big hospital, then in a rural hospital, um, moved to Phoenix, Arizona, um, practiced there for a while and came back to Kentucky and then Tennessee. So I've been in Nashville for 11 years. This is where I've been. Long history, many years, right? Practicing. <laughs> yes. Yeah, when, when did you graduate? 99. 19, 1999. Mm -hmm. And oh, that yeah. first job, it was, I know, a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> that, that first job was very interesting. Um, they made you work in the hospital for a year. Um, and they would rotate you through seeing neurological patients, cardiac patients, wound care. And I was forever grateful for that job um, because I would say 70% of the PTs there had been PTs for 20 or 30 years. So the amount of knowledge in that yeah. building was just unbelievable. Wow. Yeah. And they were that's willing nice. to teach. So I was very that, grateful for that nice. opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And how did you end up being a clinical director? Like how did, how that happen? Mm, I did not seek it out. Um, <laughs> that was, <laughs> I, um, I had this just very like little skill sets, like throughout every job I had, I had my hand had been forced a little bit and to do things that were out of my comfort zone, which you know me and that's, um, I choose to live that way a little bit because I feel like that's how I know I'm learning. If I feel yeah. uncomfortable, if I feel nervous. Um, so a little bit of vestibular therapy, a little bit of aquatic therapy, um, but never like any real leadership. And it's not that I had never wanted that. I guess I never actively pursued it. Um, so when I moved to Nashville, I was new to the area um, I'd just been here, like, seems like everybody else is a tourist. Um, so yeah. when I applied, I applied for a floater position because I thought I could learn the city that way and see where I wanted to, like, put my roots down. Um, but after they interviewed me, they said, well, we want you to be a director. And I was like, mm -mm. like, I'm not, I don't want to do that. You know, I don't. I right really, off uh, the bat. <laughs> yes, I was nervous. Didn't want to. And so we talked for a long time and they said, well, just why don't you want to do that? And I was just scared. What I love about PT is that patient interaction almost as much as the physical therapy part. I love getting to know people, um, what they do for a living, just hearing about their life stories. And I was afraid that I would have to give that up if I was in marketing or I mean in management. And I wasn't willing to do that because I feel like throughout my career, I've tried different ways to not have as big a heart and I'm not built that way. Um, and so I didn't want to lose that. And um, they were very patient with me. They said, Hey, what if we like walk you through it? What if we hold your hand? What if we baby <laughs> step it? And then if you don't like it, we'll find you another job within the company. And I said, okay, like I'll do that. Um, and they held up their end of the deal. Um, it's been a phenomenal learning experience for me. And they did just take their time with me to help develop those skill sets. And I appreciate that. Nice. How many years have you been working as a clinical director now? Um, since I've been in Nashville, so 10, so 10 11. 10, 10, mm -hmm. And I couldn't imagine so not being it now. Yeah. yeah. So that, that's great. So my next question would be the biggest challenge that you face in your career mm -hmm. as a professional physical therapist professionally and as a clinical director on the business side of things and how how did you deal with them? I think, to be honest, Mariana, one of the most challenging has been of late. Um, so our clinic was hit by the tornadoes in Nashville um, in March, and it sustained enough damage that we aren't allowed to go back in that building. Um, and then we weren't really allowed even to go back for a while just to get your personal effects, just to get your jacket, <laughs> your cup. Um, you know, I mean, things that made it home. And so you went from this bustling clinic working with people that you just love on a Tuesday and Wednesday, you don't work with them anymore. Um, we are fortunate enough to still have jobs, um, but we've kind of been spread out among different clinics. So you don't get to see your work family anymore. Um, and that's been very challenging. Um, so we now have weekly quote unquote staff meetings at my house um, to still <laughs> see each other. Um, so I think just dealing with that is just to continue to develop that sense of team. And just because you don't see each other every day, 
um, you can still be together in some way every day. Um, I also think just healthcare in general has changed so drastically since I first started. Like way back in the day, you, there really weren't any visit limits. Um, you could see people for a long time. There, if there were caps, they were so high, you never reach that. Your documentation was literally four handwritten lines, you know, subjective, what the patient said, objective, see flow sheet, assessment, you know, I mean, and, and now there's so that's many the, more that's things. That's the dream. <laughs> I know, I know. And so now there's just so many more things. And I remember when they first started to have like visit limits, I remember as just this wee young baby, I'd been a PT like four or five years, just on the phone with a private insurance company. I'll never forget this. It was a patient. She had a bilateral carpal tunnel release and um, worked in data entry. She couldn't even brush her hair and they were making, yeah. they wanted to stop paying for PT. And I remember on that phone for like 30, 45 minutes with somebody, I'm just begging for her to get more visits. And that's when I realized like sometimes my voice isn't heard. Um, that my job is to stand up for my patient and be their advocate. And sometimes no matter how hard I try, it doesn't always work. And that was frustrating. So then I had to figure out a different way to be their advocate, um, a different way to help them. And that was to empower them, um, just to empower your patient to ask the question, empower them to know what's going on, have those conversations about visit limits day one. And even though that seems harsh, like that's the reality that we're in right now. As time went on to marketing became the expectation um, that wasn't taught in school. You didn't talk about that. Nobody mm -hmm. gave you this skill set. You don't, there's not like really a CE, you know, to go about marketing. It's just like, we expect you to do this, go. Um, <laughs> so that, that was hard um, because I, I did not like it. Um, so I had to figure out a way, again, to make it my own. And it was very important for me, for my clinic to be viewed as a resource in the community. So if that means you come for PT, great. If that means you come in and ask me a question about something and don't get PT, great. I want you to be better, faster, stronger. And if that means you get PT, okay. And if not, that's okay too. Um, so the only way I knew to do that was to learn my community, um, to learn what resources are around me massage therapists, um, Pilates instructors, acupuncturist, you know, gyms, personal trainers, um, just know all those things. And then by doing that, like it creates your own little network for direct access. And you're not even trying, you're just trying to know people um, so you can help your patient when they're finished. So that was, that was probably another real hard thing is learning how to market. Yeah, I imagine because nobody talks about that when you're in no. college you're studying. And you just have to go to the world and figure it out. And I think that's very hard for us on this healthy part of things because we have no idea about any of that. So the, the advice you would give is just try to reach out to the community and spread the word. And that worked um, in East Nashville. That worked in this community. Um, mm -hmm. Others, it may not. You may be better off in other places getting to know referral sources more. Mm -hmm. um, and getting to know referral coordinators more. Um, but East Nashville is very much a small city and a big city. Um, so that worked well here. I think it also depends on the individual clinician's comfort, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're calling on people that you're uncomfortable or nervous talking to, they can pick up on that. So yeah. I would just, I guess my advice would be to make it yours. Mark it in a way that you're comfortable with, that you can own. Um, and that you feel that you can learn and grow in as well. And how about the direct access that we know it's hard to get them? So what do you think that works best on that scenario to get that patients? I think, um, again, by reaching out to the community, a lot mm -hmm. of the programs that we started to offer at East Nashville came from the direct access patients um, because they would come to us and say, hey, do you offer cupping? Do you offer dry needling? Do you offer? So it was very much driven and that part of being a resource with the community is to provide what they want. Um, mm -hmm. It does no good to be a bakery that sells only chocolate chip cookies if everybody wants sugar, you know? So, I mean, yeah. you have to provide them with what they need. So that's how a lot of those niche programs developed at the clinic, uh, them asking for it. Yeah. So that relates to the next question that is like, what extra courses that you do to help on your practice and why have you chosen them? And relating to the previous question, so how did you know what the community needed? And like, do you think it's 
valid. Like it's good to just try to look at the courses that people need in your area to offer them what they need. Um, I think to be an active listener with your patients, direct access or not, um, because they have access to so much information now um, through the internet, um, through articles that they read. And a lot of times it's patient driven. They'll mm -hmm. say, Hey, I read an article about fill in the blank. What do you think about that? Um, and so just to listen. And if you hear enough of that going around, you need to step up your game and you need to like educate yourself to provide them what they need. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that, um, and the courses, as far as what specific courses, like, let's just say people mentioned dry needling, which dry needling did I choose? Um, I feel incredibly fortunate at star. They have an unbelievable continuing ed education program. Um, they offer multiple courses for us throughout the year. And so if you have an interest coming up, you just need to look and see what's available. The McKinsey courses, like we, you briefly touched on that. I wish I'd taken those earlier in my career. Um, I didn't start taking those until maybe five years ago. And now I'm McKinsey certified, maybe, maybe longer than that, five or six years ago. But I feel like it's huge in developing just your thought process and a good rationale to base, um, evaluation and treatment decisions on. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really good way to organize thought. And I know you're McKinsey certified. So don't, do you feel that way too? Yeah. It, yeah. it made a huge difference on my practice, the way you think, the, the way you assess and like self-treatment prevention. I think it's a really good asset to have. I think so too. And it, um, talking about empowering the patient, that's yeah. huge. Yeah. And especially now, that. right? Like on this telehealth and everything, yes. and it helps a lot. All this education process and all the, the movements that we can test, that we don't, don't have to have the hands on. So it helps a lot in this situation as well. And they feel very much that they're in control. Yeah. Um, and I think that also fosters that sense of independence um, and not feeling like they have to have us. Yeah. Um, and especially that's what you want anyway, but especially in a time where you have 10 visits for the calendar year, you know, um, <laughs> like you have to be efficient and effective. Yeah. 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 And how about dry needling that I know that you use? Um, what do you, how does that work? Like, what do you think about the method, the technique? Um, I was very hesitant to start that. Um, I think it was just my own nerves about that. Um, it has been incredibly effective, I found, for headaches, like that chronic upper trap, that upper quarter mm -hmm. pain. It, I found like mixed results with back pain, um, but significant results with really pinpoint like shoulder pain and knee mm -hmm. pain as well. It's acupuncture needles, and that's the only thing that's the same. You know, we're going after trigger points, top muscle groups. Um, it's very, it doesn't take very much clinic time, and I feel like that's what I was afraid of initially because the thought process is to create a local microtrauma. It's not like acupuncture where you have to leave the needle in for a long time. If you're thinking about our rationale to create microtrauma, to increase blood flow, to help circulation, help the muscle relax, as soon as you put the needle in, your goal's met. Um, so you can take it immediately back out. Um, a lot of times patients are nervous cause they hear needle. Um, yeah. when you show them, it's like fishing line. <laughs> and a lot of times if I talk about doing it, I will put one like on the unaffected extremity on an unaffected part. And just so they can see it and feel it. And um, then once the fears are moved, they're open to try it. I don't know if I told you this, Mariana, but like I'd had just tremendous hip pain for a while and it was incredibly deep. And so deep, I was just convinced it was a labral tear or like something just intracapsular um, because every time after I would sit or anything with like a lot of extended hip flexion for protracted time, when I would stand up, I could hardly bear weight. It was so painful. Um, and at the dry needling course, that was the first thing we dry needled was the hips. And I had almost no pain the next day. And I thought, oh, wow. Hmm, maybe there's something to this here. Um, so I was convinced just after that. Nice. That's very interesting. And did you have any remarkable outcome with the dry needling with your patients that you would like to share? Anything in particular that you remember? I'm just thinking in particular of somebody. Um, she was in a pretty significant car accident. 
And she'd also sustained a concussion. So she had some con post-concussion symptoms, but suboccipital headaches were unrelenting for her. She worked in an office. She had to be on the computer and her headaches would become so severe that she would have to leave home, leave work to go home. Um, mm -hmm. So once we started to do dry needling in the suboccipital, just after the first time she came back the next visit within the same week. So it was like two days different in tears um, because that was the first time she hadn't had a headache since the accident. Um, like there's that. Um, and then there was somebody that we had seen him post-op knee surgery and he is very active, avid traveler. Um, and he couldn't mountain bike because of his quad pain. Um, so once we started dry needling his quad, he sent me a video from the Alps where he was um, riding his mountain bike in the Alps. And he said like he couldn't have done that before dry needling. So there are those cases that's, they're pretty remarkable. That's awesome. That's so rewarding to have this feedback with like, you're, you're really making a difference in someone's life. So I think that's very exciting. And Sandy, I also know that you use a lot of your yoga experience on your practice. Yes. So how, how do you think that the yoga help you to, to be a better clinician? I think it changes the goggles that you look at the body. Um, so if you talk to a body worker that is, does a lot of fascial work or a massage therapist, the way they look at the body is different. Um, and I very much feel like yoga has made me look at how people's alignment a little bit different. I'm so sorry. Some dogs. <laughs> um, but it's um, helped me look at their alignment a little bit different. It makes me slow down. Um, I feel like my verbal cues to correct posture are different as well. And it's like the subtle, subtle cues. I practice Iyengar yoga and you will receive maybe 50 different things to think about in one pose. Um, so I think by doing that, it also helps your patient to learn that the devil's in the details, you know, mm -hmm. and if I'm giving you a lot of things to think about, if you remember one, Hey, kudos. Um, yeah. It also gives you like different subtle tricks to help open the spine, to help open the rotator cuff. Um, a lot of patients, if you were to tell them they were practicing yoga, there would be some pushback. Um, but if you just kind of give them some stretches, they enjoy it. Um, and also just helps to breathe. When we were talking in this time of managing pain and neuroscience pain education, a lot of it's talking about a good sleep hygiene program, like good diaphragmatic breathing. Um, and so through yoga, I've learned lots of different breathing exercises. And so that really feeds into that neuroscience of pain and helping people to calm themselves, um, which is huge if you're in a lot yeah. of pain. Yeah. So that's nice. That's a, a lot of good uh, other techniques to add to the treatment. So I think everything mm -hmm. it's, is valuable. And so Sandy, uh, I want to ask you now three questions that I, I'm going to ask every po pro guest here. Mm -hmm. So my first question, what is your favorite resource of information? Do you have any book or a specific paper or article, mm. anything that you like in particular? I'm trying to think of like any one thing. I think I'm just like thirsty for new knowledge. You know, a lot of times, whether it's, um, I can't say I'm married to one particular journal or anything. I think I'm more topic focused. So like, we've been dealing a lot with just sleep hygiene. Um, we're trying to establish a treatment program for musicians. Um, so trying to just search out through journals mainly, but not really anyone in particular. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Second question. What would be the best advice you can give to the clinicians that are just starting their careers? Be open. Don't think that you will end up where you think you'd start. Um, when I came out of school, I was convinced I would be inpatient neuro, period, end of story. Um, <laughs> and now I'm the total opposite end of that. And I never would have guessed that in a million years. So when an employer provides you with an opportunity, try it. Um, if you hate it, okay, like that's important to know too. But what if you yeah. love it? That's yeah. just as important to know. Um, so just not be afraid to try. That's very important because some things that we think that it's not for us and then suddenly you try and changes your whole career, your whole perspective. So 
that's by saying that's yes very to being true. a director. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good example. So yeah, yeah, that that changed everything, and now you can even imagine not being I a director. Can't. So mm -mm. yeah, that's that's crazy. And last question: What personal abilities or qualities that you think someone needs to have to become a successful physical therapist? The desire to learn. Um, and whether that's PT related, whether that's learning about your patient, learning your referral sources, you have to learn. Um, and it has to be a deep thirst that you wake up every day wanting to do that. Because what we do changes so much. Um, the research changes, how we get paid changes, the patients come in our door change. So just to learn, like you're going to, they're going to run out of stuff to learn. <laughs> like, <laughs> Just be thirsty, thirsty for that. That's a good, good advice. So Sandy, as we reach to the end of the show, I really appreciate you here with me, dedicating your time to be here. And for people that want to know more about you and your work, um, how they can find more information? You can go um, to the Star Physical Therapy website. Um, you can feel free to email me at sandy.murphy at starpt.com if you have any questions about anything. Um, those are the best ways. Good. So I'm going to just get all the information and put on the um, Great. show description. And Great. everybody can just find all the information there. Uh, so Sandy, I really appreciate, I enjoy uh, our conversation a lot, learn a lot of things, and I hope that everybody that is listening to us um, learn something too. So thank you very much and hope that you have a great end of your day. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for the invitation, Mariana.